Beautiful. So hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on understanding arthritis medications. My name's Bree. I'm the Health Promotion Coordinator for Arthritis Queensland. And for today's webinar, we'll be taking a closer look into arthritis medications. So I really need to make this quite clear. So this webinar is, is just a general presentation of common arthritis medications. So I'm not an expert in medications. I haven't been trained in medication area. The experts to give you expert advice on medications are your doctor, um, your rheumatologist and a pharmacist. So they are trained in this area and they can um, answer your uh, um, medication questions. So we've, met, we've made every effort to make sure this information is accurate and reliable, and it's not a substitute for the individual treatment advice from your doctor or health professional. So always, always, always um, talk to your doctor or rheumatologist for individual medication or medical or treatment advice. So in spirit of reconciliation, Arthritis Queensland and New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and um, community. We pay our respect to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So today we're going to be uh, covering a few different topics where we'll be discussing some common arthritis medications such as pain relievers, um, NSAIDs, DMARDs, opioids and topical creams. And we'll also discuss the mechanisms of action of these medications in managing arthritis symptoms and slowing disease progression. So we'll also discuss the potential side effects and safety considerations associated with these um, common arthritis medications. And then we'll finish off the webinar by learning tips and strategies for managing multiple medications commonly used in arthritis treatment. All right, so let's get started on some common arthritis medications. So analgesics, also known as pain relievers, they are often the first medicine your doctor will recommend to help with pain. So pa some pain relievers are available without a prescription, while others must be prescribed by your doctor. While paracetamol is one of the oldest forms of anal analge analgesics, current research indicates that on its own, Paracetamol is ineffective in the treatment of lower back pain and provides minimal short-term benefit for people with hip or knee osteoarthritis. So the different types of pain relievers are, is paracetamol or osteopanadol. And these are simple um, pain relievers that may ease mild to moderate pain. There's also some stronger pain relievers such as a combination of paracetamol and codeine, um, so tramadol and a range of morphine-like medicines, also known as opioids. So the effects of them, pain relievers act on your nervous system to reduce pain. So they work by blocking the pain signals in the brain and spinal cord and um, reducing the perception of pain. So unlike our NSAIDs, so our um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they do not affect other symptoms such as joint swelling or stiffness. They primarily provide pain relief. So how are they used? The pain relievers in some case, um, the pain can be controlled by using these medications just when it's needed. Sometimes pain is better controlled by taking them regularly. So for example, some people might take them multiple times a day but definitely have a chat with your doctor or pharmacist for advice on the best way to take these medications for your condition. So the risks and side effects. So paracetamol has a few side effects when taken at the recommended dose. However, taking the, more than the recommended daily dose can potentially cause um, severe liver problems. So be careful when taking pain relievers with over-the-counter medications, so such as those cold and flu tablets, because they actually also contain paracetamol and you may accidentally take more than the recommended daily dose. So your risk of 
Experiencing side effects from pain relievers depends on the type you take and how long you take it for. So, um, so there are some side effects to the stronger pain relievers and they can cause um, constipation or diarrhea. They can also cause an upset stomach, heartburn or stomach ulcers. There also may be that ringing in the ears or vomiting and drowsiness. Some people have reported to have some allergic reactions to them, you know, itchy skin or they have some rashes. Uh, In some cases, they may cause heart problems and then problems forming blood clots, which may lead to excessive bleeding. So always have a chat to your pharmacist for advice before taking any over-the-counter medicines and just have a chat with with them about the current medication that you're on as well. So the next one we're going to talk about is our non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So I'm going to be referring to these as NSAIDs. So NSAIDs reduce inflammation, um, joint, joint swelling and stiffness. So they're often used to treat inflammatory forms of arthritis such as you know, rheumatoid or ankylosing spondylitis or sciatic arthritis. And they can also relieve pain that is not controlled by pain reliever medication alone. So some NSAIDs are available without a prescription, while others must be prescribed by a doctor. So the different types. So there's many different types of NSAIDs available, such as ibuprofen, aspirin, or naproxen. Um, And there's a certain group of NSAIDs called COX-2 inhibitors. And these are slightly less likely to cause stomach problems. So the effects of NSAIDs, so they stop the body producing prostaglandins that cause inflammation and pain within the body. So this helps reduce symptoms such as that pain and swelling that's often associated with arthritis. And NSAIDs, it's really important to note that they don't cure your arthritis or have a long-term effect on it. So how can they be used? So some conditions can be effectively controlled by using NSAIDs only when needed. Other conditions may require more regular use of NSAIDs, but your doctor or pharmacist will give you the best advice on how to take them for your condition and how to reduce the dose of NSAIDs if your pain has eased. So there's multiple different ways that NSAIDs can be taken. So it can come in tablets or capsules that you swallow, or if you have any issues swallowing um, tablets or uh, capsules, it can also come in a liquid. So you can just drink it. And then you've got your topical NSAIDs. So they can come as like a cream or a gel. Even it can come as a spray or plaster. And in some cases, a mousse that you can actually apply to the skin in your affected joints. So with NSAIDs, um, they may not be suitable for everyone. And the type of NSAID you are prescribed also may depend upon other health issues, such such as if you're over 65 or that you might be pregnant or you're breastfeeding. If you have um, asthma or other allergies, if you've had a reaction to an NSAID before, if you've got stomach ulcers or bleeding in your stomach, they're not suitable for you. If you've had any problems with your heart, your liver, kidney, any problems with blood pressure or blood circulation, if you are taking other medicines, um, as well as if you've had a stroke or problems with your intestines or bowels, such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, um, pr- problems with your blood pressure, circulation or bleeding, and then if you experience persistent headaches. So always talk to your doctor or pharmacist before taking NSAIDs as they may cause some serious side effects. So if you have problems with your blood pressure or kidneys or your heart, then the risk of a heart attack or stroke or kidney failure may be increased. Even though some NSAIDs are available without prescription, your doctor can advise which of the NSAIDs and dosage is best for you. So if you're taking anticoagulant drugs to thin your blood, such as a low-dose 
aspirin or a warfarin, um, you're best to avoid taking other NSAIDs or, compa or compound killers. Even at, the low, even at low doses, NSAIDs can have some side effects such as headaches, dizziness. Um, some people experience that stomach pains. So it could be sickness, um, diarrhea or indigestion, you know, heartburn as well. Uh, it can cause uh, swollen ankles. Um, some people reported having problems urinating. There could be chest pains and difficulty breathing. Um, a rash or sensitivity to sunlight, and then bleeding of the stomach and upper intestine. This is a really serious side effect of, side effect of NSAIDs. Um, so signs of bleeding include stomach pain. There could also be blood in your stools or they're really, really dark colored stools. And then there's coffee colored vomit is an indication that you've got bleeding in your stomach. So if you have any of these side effects, you should see your doctor as soon as possible um, while taking the NSAIDs, if you're taking those NSAIDs. So if you experience any of these side effects, stop taking that pain relief and speak to the doctor because long-term use of NSAIDs can cause um, problems with your liver, kidney and heart and also your blood circulation. They can cause stomach problems and definitely best taken with food or a drink of milk to help reduce some of these side effects. And if you're over, um, if you're aged over 65, some NSAIDs can increase your risk of developing stomach ulcers. And if you're at risk of developing stomach problems or you get stomach pains after you've taken an NSAID um, medication, you must speak to your doctor. And long-term use of them should be really monitored by a healthcare professional. So the next one that we're going to talk about is corticosteroids. So um, the most common is prednisone or cortisone, and these are potent anti-inflammatory medications. Um, and they're used to the use is to quickly reduce inflammation and symptoms during arthritis flares. So they're often used to treat inflammatory forms of arthritis but um, they can also be used to treat a single inflamed joint. So as I've mentioned, the two different types is prednisone or cortisone. So um, they can be taken by mouth or um, as tablets or liquids, and they can also be given by injection into a joint, muscle or soft tissue. So the medicines have a really strong anti-inflammatory effect and reduce and they can reduce pain and swelling. However, it's really, really important to know that they actually don't cure the disease at all. So how are they used? Um, your doctor will prescribe the lowest possible dose for the shortest time due to the risk of the side effects. So you may need to restart the, these medications again if you're experiencing a, another arthritis flare. So these type of medications um, can have a really serious side effect if taken in high doses or for a long time, which is typically more than a few weeks. So your doctor will monitor you for side effects while you're taking corticosteroids. So com some common side effects include weight gain, um, it could cause thinning of your bones, which can lead to osteoporosis. It can result in high blood pressure or glaucoma, um, increase your risk of depression, gastrointestinal bleeding and ulcers. It can actually thin your skin as well and cause um, impaired wound healing and also increase your susceptibility to infections. You know, it's very important to have the use of corticosteroids monitored closely by your healthcare professional. So the next one that we're going to talk about is um, a topical pain relief creams. So these can include um, topical pain, um, topical creams that are brought over the counter or from prescription based creams. So the capsaicin cream has been shown in um, research and trials to be effective in some cases for managing pain. So the capsaicin is taken from the chili peppers and it works by mainly reducing substance P. 
So this is a pain transmitter in our nerves and it's involved in the transmission from pain impulses from our nerve endings, which is near our skin and joint to the brain. So as it reduces substance P, it can help reduce the pain that we feel. And it works as a pain reliever and, um, being, and it's, help, it's been used in the past to help with peripheral nerve pain. So how are they used? The topical pain relief cream. So in trials, they were, sorry, that was, my, that was Siri on my phone, which is really right. Um, sorry, that just scared me. So the dosage in trials have either been used as a 0.25% and then upwards to a 0.75% of the capsaicin gel. And it, in the trials, they applied it to the skin four times a day. So for it can be available um, by prescription. So that's like the kind of the higher dosage can be available by prescription, but it also can be found in some of the over-the-counter gels and cream medications. So that would be on the lower end of like how much capsaicin is found in it. So there's no actual side effects reported with um, this topical pain relief cream. However, you may feel some slight burning sensation and a brief redness um, when applied. And that's quite common when, you know, you apply it to your skin and you give it a massage. But it's important to keep it away from your eyes, mouth or open wounds because it may burn. So it's um, always have a chat to your GP um, and see whether they think this capsaicin gel could be really helpful. And they might prescribe you, you know, a dosage that is a little bit higher as well. So opioids, so narcotics is the next medication that we're going to have a chat about. So these are often used to treat moderate to severe pain when patients don't respond well to other pain medications. So if not used properly, opioids can increase rather than decrease your pain. So what this means is that opioids do provide relief by blocking the pain. But as a result, our body reacts by increasing the number of receptors to try to get that pain signal through again. So then, so what this means is that over time, the same dosage may not be effective and they need to keep increasing your dosage to get that same pain relieving effect, which is quite, it's not like a safe thing to do really. So there's two different types of opioids and it's divided into those two groups. So the first one is opiates, which is produced from the opium poppy plant, and that includes the illegal opioid heroin. And then the second type is the synthetic substances. So this is produced in the lab from chemicals and commonly used opioid medicines contain um, active ingredients such as codeine, uh, fentanyl, um, morphine, oxycodone, methadone and tramadol and these are just to name a few but there's definitely more out there and these medicines can obviously be taken in many, many different ways such as tablets or pill forms it can be done via injection or even patches on the skin so some people who have been taking opioid medication for long periods of time may require some larger doses to get that same effect but may also run the risk of some serious side effects and becoming more sensitive to pain. And due to the risk of side effects such as addiction and overdose, healthcare professionals are advised to avoid prescribing opioid painkillers for long-term pain where possible. If you are prescribed opioid painkillers, your treatment should be strictly monitored. So the risks and side effects of them, opioid painkillers, um, so they commonly cause a lot more side effects than other any other pain treatment. And they, as mentioned in the previous slide, they really need to be strictly monitored by your doctor. Some, some risks and side effects of the opioid painkillers include feeling sick and physically being sick. Um, it could be problems going to the toilet, whether it's constipation or issues urinating. Um, it can cause itchy, so you can feel extremely itchy. 
um, and they can also affect your cognitive abilities and can result you in feeling drowsy and dizzy, um, also not being able to concentrate as well. It can also lower um, your sex drive, reduce fertility and cause erectile dysfunction. And some people have a lot of difficulty fighting off infections when taking opioid medications. It can actually increase your pain, um, cause breathing problems, and some can cause seizures as well. And then the biggest one is that it can cause some serious addictions and should be taken with some great, great caution. So your doctor may recommend you to stop taking opioids and depending on how long you've been taking them, you may also experience some withdrawal reactions, including um, tremors or muscle spasms. It can cause um, anxiety, sweating or restlessness, sickness, diarrhea and stomach cramps as well. So why opioids alone are not the answer? There's a lot of research showing that opioids are not effective long term. So they contribute on average to only a 30% reduction in pain and they can come with some pretty unwanted and serious side effects. So after a short while, um, people may develop a tolerance to opioids and the dosage must be progressively increased to get that same pain relieving effect. So the high dosages, high doses, sorry, and long-term use of um, opioids may lead to an increased pain experience. And this is referred to as opioid-induced hyperglasia. So opioid-induced hyperglasia is defined as an increased sensitivity to feeling pain and an extreme response to pain. So this may occur when there is damage to the nerves or chemical changes to the um, nerve pathways involved in sensing pain. This may be caused by tissue injury or inflammation or by taking certain drugs such as opioids for chronic pain. So often the most effective way to manage that persistent chronic pain is to not just rely on using medications alone, but also using multiple methods at once. So there is not one method that will just work, but it's collectively doing various things that can help you manage pain. So evidence shows that people with persistent pain who are, doing, uh, who are actively involved in managing their pain on a daily basis have less disability than those who are engaged in passive therapies, such as just taking medications or surgery. So relying solely on medications can have limitations and potential side effects, and it does not address other critical aspects of overall health and well-being. So adopting a holistic approach is essential for arthritis management. So there's a benefits of the of this approach include aspects like exercise, as we know, uh, regular exercise can help maintain joint function, help reduce arthritis pain, stiffness and improve flexibility and can make daily tasks a lot easier. It also strengthens muscles around your joint, which can help reduce strain and also helps boost mood and release natural in, um, release endorphins, which are natural pain relievers. A healthy diet um, rich in any inflammatory foods can help reduce inflammation and also supports weight management and provides um, you with essential nutrients like calcium and vitamin D and antioxidants, which are vital, vital for bone and joint health, as well as your immune system. And quality sleep is definitely crucial for the body's repair processes. And it can also help with improving mood, cognitive function and emotional resilience, which can be important for managing arthritis. We actually have a sleep um, and arthritis webinar next month. So make sure you register and tune in for that. It's got some great tips in there as well. And then finally, relaxation techniques. So meditation and deep breathing practices can help lower stress levels and reduce muscle tension. And they can help with pain management and be a great tool in managing arthritis daily. 
So I just thought I'd add in this extra slide, just um, wild medications are really definitely an essential part of arthritis management. They should also be complemented with some with these factors. And these don't, these aren't everything. There's definitely a lot more things out there because um, they can all help you manage symptoms more effectively, but also enhance your overall health and quality of life. All right, so the next ones that we're going to talk about is DMARDs, and that stands for Disease Modifying Anti-Rheumatic Drugs. So I'll be referring to them as DMARDs. So these are used to treat inflammatory forms of arthritis, such as rheumatoid, um, ankylosing spondylitis and sciatic arthritis and many DMARDs what they do is act on your immune system to cause that immunosuppression so this actually reduces the activity of the immune system which is attacking and damaging healthy joints um, this can not only relieve symptoms but it can also re reduce the risk of long-term damage to your joints Traditional DMARDs, such as methotrexate, they work by inhibiting um, immune cells evolved in the in inflammatory response. So thereby reducing joint inflammation and preventing that damage to the joints over time. So DMARDs can be used on their own or they can be combined with other DMARDs or medicines to gain the best control of your arthritis. So there's also a specific group of DMARDs available and these are called biological DMARDs. So these block certain substances in the blood and joints that cause that inflammation. This reduces inflammation and halts joint damage and they specifically target components of the immune system which is involved in that inflammatory process. So by blocking these inflammatory pathways it can help reduce inflammation it can slow joint damage and improve symptoms um, in inflammatory forms of arthritis. Biological DMARDs can only be used if other DMARDs have not worked. So DMARDs and biological DMARDs are usually only prescribed by specialists, so such as a rheumatologist, and regular blood tests are usually necessary to test the effectiveness of these medicines and to check for any unwanted side effects as well. So I'm not going to go into heaps of detail um, about these types of medications because we actually have Professor Helen Benham. So she's a rheumatologist. Um, she's actually presenting a webinar specifically on biologics and biosimilars in October. So she is an expert, she's a rheumatologist, and she's going to be focusing an entire webinar on these types of medications. So if you really want some um, great information on DMARDs and biologics, i definitely register and watch that because she'll have some fantastic um, information on that. So I will mention some of the common um, side effects of uh, DMARDs and biologics. So they can cause a loss of appetite. They can cause nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and even rashes um, on your skin and like allergic reactions as well. They can cause liver problems. And that's why there needs to be um, lots of blood tests just to check how your liver is going. Um, and they can also increase the risk of infections. So that's due to them suppressing your immune system. So um, it, as you know, with uh, inflammatory forms of arthritis, um, people, it's an autoimmune condition. So the immune system is attacking its joints and your body. So these medications will suppress your immune system. And because of that, um, people can be immunocompromised when taking these um, types of medications. So that's why um, some people are more susceptible to illnesses and infections. Um, and they can also cause lower white blood cell count, um, cause anemia and low platelet count as well. So most people can um, use over-the-counter pain relief. So I thought it would be really important to touch on these things um, 
that, you know, if you have any of these issues and it, you may need to be really cautious when taking over-the-counter medication and always have a chat to your pharmacist or doctor or whoever, um, healthcare professional, before you start taking them. So if you're underweight or you're under the age of 16 or over 65, if you're breast, um, breastfeeding or pregnant, if you have lung problems such as asthma, if you've had fits or seizures before or any allergies, um, persistent headaches or have any problems with your liver or kidneys, if you've had any ulcers or bleeding in your stomach, um, if you've had any problems with your heart, your liver, your kidneys, blood pressure or circulation, if you are taking other medications or if you've had a stroke or drink more than 14 units of alcohol a week, just be really cautious of taking um, over-the-counter medication and always have a chat to your pharmacist or doctor just to make sure that there's not going to be any drug interactions with any other medications that you're taking as well. All right, so now we're going to finish off the webinar by going through um, some tips on ways to manage multiple medications. So the first point is um, to have medication review. So schedule these regular medication reviews with your healthcare provider to make sure that your treatment plan is optimized and that you're taking the right medications at the right dosages. It's always important to keep a list of your medications and that includes prescription or over-the-counter ones, even supplements and vitamins, and bring them to your healthcare appointments for review. So Webster packs. So these are um, pre-packed blister packs that organize your weekly medication according to the day and time they need to be taken. So you can see here breakfast, lunch, dinner, and bedtime on a Monday. So this helps reduce confuse, confusion and make sure you take the right medication at the right time. So consider using Webster packs to simplify medication management, especially if you're taking multiple medications throughout the day and they can really help reduce the risk of um, missing dosages, um, doses and ensure that you're make, uh, taking your medications as prescribed. So how to get one? You can have a chat to your pharmacist who will need to review all your medications and determine whether one is suitable for you. And once they receive all your scripts, they will have a chat with your doctor to obtain a medication profile. So this is a summary of all the medications um, written by your GP. And then the pharmacist will organize your medications into weekly packs tailored to your needs, which will um, you will need to collect weekly. So the cost of the Webster pack um, varies on um, depending on the size and type of dispenser you choose. So you may only have one local pharmacy option near you um, or you may not even have a pharmacy that will do it so that it might not even be available in your area. But on average, a Webster pack at a, an Australian pharmacy will cost anywhere from $12 right up to $40 a month. And this covers the pharmacist or technician weekly packing costs. Um, and due to the uh, shortage of workers in the pharmacy industry, this cost may increase. In addition to this fee, you will still need to pay for your, um, your regular medications as you normally would. So it's that $12 or $40 a month on top of all your medication costs. And obviously all prices vary depending on the store you purchase them from. So if the Webster pack is too expensive or it's not something you'd like to try, there's definitely some alternatives there that are more affordable. So you have these manual pill dispensers and these are simple and affordable and they work by using a manual mechanism to dispense your medication. So they're a great option for those who don't want to spend um, a lot of money on the more sophisticated Webster pack alternative. All right, so medication adherence. So adherence to medication is crucial for managing arthritis effectively and preventing disease progression. 
So make a habit of taking your medications as prescribed by your healthcare provider. So set up reminders to take your medications at the same time each day using alarm clocks, phone alerts, or even those pill organizers, and that can help you stay on track. You can um, establish a routine for taking your medications. So some people associate taking them with their meals or um, other daily activities, and it just helps to make it easier to remember to take them. And it's really important to know your medications. So educate yourself about your medications, and that includes their names, their purposes, the dosages, and potential side effects. And understanding your medications can help you recognize any issues or changes to your treatment plan. So ask questions to your doctor or um, rheumatologist or pharmacist about your um, medications to make sure that you have a clear understanding of how they work and how to take them properly. So keep an open line of communication with your healthcare team, and that includes, you know, your GP, your rheumatologist and pharmacist. Inform them of any changes to your symptoms, medications or treatment preferences. Discuss any concerns or barriers to medication adherence with them. And this could be the cost of them, um, any side effects that you're experiencing, or even if you're having difficulty swallowing the pills, there might be a liquid form that, um, is e that you can take instead of the tablet form to make it easier um, to take them. And the, your healthcare team, they can help um, work with you to address any of these issues and find the solutions that work best for you. Um, stay organised. So keep your medications organized and stored in a safe place away from children and pets and make sure you have an ample supply of medications and refill them um, just so you don't uh, so you can avoid running out of um, the medications and consider using a medication tracker or journal to record when you take your medications and any side effects or changes in the sim um, symptoms that you experience. And finally, some tips. Um, so under, it's really important to understand why you're taking the medicine and what the possible side effects are. You can actually um, ask your pharmacist for the consumer medicines information leaflet uh, for that particular medicine. So you can do up your own reading about it and it will go through a lot more information. If you're taking any medications prescribed by your rheumatologist, you can ask the rheumatologist for that medication leaflet about it, or you can visit the Australian Rheumatology Association website. And they've got like a whole search tab from A to Z of any, um, you know, medications pres prescribed about um, from your rheumatologist. Always read all medicine labels and take medicines as directed. If you have any questions, have a chat with your doctor or pharmacist. And keep a personal record of all of them, including dosages and allergies. And it can be really useful when you're talking to your doctor or pharmacist. And always ask them before taking any over-the-counter medications, including natural medicines, or some as some medicines do cause a lot of issues when they're taken together. And don't share them with any of your friends and relatives as it could be quite harmful to them. So there's a really great info line number that you can call it's a free info line call number it's called medicine line and if you have any medication questions you can ring this info line number um, and it can be anything about prescription or over-the-counter medications or even complementary medicines um, and there will be a pharmacist or a healthcare professional at the end of the phone that can actually talk to you about that medication so their free call number is 1300 633 and 424. All right. I'm just going to um, stop the recording. Um, stop recording and yeah.